Hi Spring fans! In this installment of Spring Tips, we're going to look at the new features in Spring Security 5 which are designed to support uh, security in a reactive Spring Web Flux application. So let's create a new demo here on uh, start.spring.io. We're going to use Spring Boot 2.0 M2 which is due, you know, the final release of Spring Boot is due uh, this December so we'll, we'll take advantage of some of the milestones here. Uh, security demo and we're going to use the reactive web support. Now at the moment there is no uh, auto configuration or starter for Spring Security, so uh, we, we'll just have to configure it ourselves manually. And I, uh, you know, I'm using giant ironic air quotes here because, as you'll see, it's it's almost trivial how much configuration configuration is required to get that to work. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll use that to secure a reactive endpoint. So here we go, security demo, and we'll point ourselves to that project descriptor, the Maven project descriptor and open this up in our IDE. And what we'll do as a first cut, you know, the first thing we're gonna do is just build a simple, trivial REST endpoint that returns a hello world message. What else, right? So security demo application, and we'll create a web configuration endpoint here. And it's gonna be a configuration class, and therein we're gonna define a route function. Okay, so route functions, routes, and uh, we'll say return router functions dot route request predicates dot dot get forward slash message and we're going to return a new handler function this is the callback that Spring Web Flux is expecting us to satisfy uh, in order to respond to incoming requests so we'll say re server response dot okay dot body mono dot just hello world and we're going to tell the framework that we're sending back a string, okay? So let's go ahead and start this up. Now, this is a functional interface. You'll notice that IntelliJ is telling us it's a functional interface, and so we could uh, re re reduce this to a lambda, but for our purposes, I think it just makes sense to use method references, because functional interfaces uh, lend themselves to method references just as easily as they do lambda. So here, I can say this handle, and uh, we can refactor this to be called message, there we are, that makes it cleaner, and uh, we can also strip away these sort of static import uh, prefixes here, that makes it even more clean and approachable, and uh, there we go. So we have, we have our code cleaned up. Now let's go ahead and see if it's working. curl HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash message. There's our simple message. Now, the message is interesting, but let's contextualize it. Let's, uh, you know, personalize it just a little bit. We know, uh, once we add security, that we you know we'll know who would user it is so let's add security and then we'll um, we'll uh, personalize the message to reflect the currently authenticated user so to add security we need to bring in the three dependencies that comprise the core of the uh, Spring Security Web Flux support so we say Spring Security Config and we don't have to manage the versions thankfully that's already done for us Spring Boot five uh, Spring Boot two rather has Spring Security five uh, you know configured and managed for us in the version ranges. So that's just a, just a simple chore, bring in the core support, the Webflux support, and the config support. And with that, we need to teach Spring Security uh, how to answer the requirement of authentication and authorization. So first we'll do authentication. We'll say security, security configuration, and we're gonna make this a configuration class. I'm gonna activate the Webflux security support in there and then uh, you know Spring Web Flux just like Spring, Se Spring Security with Spring Web Flux just like traditional Spring Security has uh, at its heart the concept of an authentication manager and uh, it can in turn delegate to a uh, react sort of to a user details repository which more or less corresponds to a DAO authentication provider in the traditional Spring Security world and it in turn is responsible for answering requests that uh, are you know, authentication requests that are done in terms of usernames and passwords. So we can provide a very simple, uh, re reactive, friendly user details repository here um, that has just a few inbuilt users and passwords, right? And uh, we can configure this using the map user details repository. We're not talking to a proper identity provider here, nothing like LDAP or Active Directory or something like that uh, for now because we just want to demonstrate what it looks like to, to make this work. Behind the, screen, behind the scenes, Spring Security is going to create an authentication manager for you that uses this user details repository. So we don't have to do any of that wiring 
if we don't want to. Now we need a few users, users of course, so let's create a username uh, for jlong, a user for jlong. Uh, the role, of course, is just user, and the password, of course, is password, because of course it is, right? So there's that. And uh, we'll create the jlong user, and I'll just duplicate this to create rwinch's user, and rwinch, of course, is Rob Winch, the lead of the Spring Security Project. Uh, and I'm sure he would love it if you grab the bits and tried out some of the stuff we're talking about here uh, and fed back. So please do. So jlong, rwinch, those are two users. And what this is going to do, this default configuration with this annotation and this one bean, this is going to lock down everything uh, and restrict access to any resource, no matter what the name of the resource, um, uh, assuming that request is authenticated. And we can see that here. Let's just uh, restart the application and we'll turn on verbose logging here for the curl call. And you can see it says 401 unauthorized. And I can now authorize myself by saying jlong colon password. That's my username and password. There's the message, however impersonal. So let's now personalize the message. We'll take this a bit further. We'll say uh, server request dot principal p hello p dot get name, right? So p dot oh, principal dot map p dot get name extra exclamation marks right so there's this and uh, we'll say principal publisher okay so we're going to use that principal publisher instead of the uh, default one that we just provided before but the results should basically be what we, what we expect so let's go ahead and restart this see the results so if I make the if I make the call now, it says hello jlong, right? There's the, res the response down there. Uh, and that's working. That's working as we expect. If I uh, authenticate as rwinch, rwinch, I get hello rwinch. So it's clearly aware of the uh, of the um, the authenticated principle. Now we can do something a little more interesting. Now we can look at authorization, right? Uh, and, and in so doing, we have to uh, prescribe the default authorization for all the other endpoints that right now Spring Security is doing for us, right? So uh, the default behavior here is that if we just do authentication and we don't provide any, any uh, ideas as to how it should do authorization, it'll just lock down everything. We can be a little more specific, but we have to now make sure to cover the ground that we gain, that we, that we gain by not uh, specifying this manually. We, we have to recl rec reclaim that, that ground because uh, once we exert some control over one, uh, one route, one endpoint, uh, Spring Security is going to expect us to uh, provide authorization for all of it, right? For all the endpoints. Otherwise, it'll just leave it as default. So let's create a bean here. A security web filter chain. We're just going to call this the security endpoint. We're going to inject the Spring Security HTTP security DSL there. And we'll say build. There's our DSL. What we're going to say is we're going to say authorize exchange dot any exchange is authenticated, right? And there we are. So that's our first bit of configuration. That should be where we were before, basically. It's going to require that everything be authenticated. Let's see if that works. Okay, so there's hello, Rob Winch. What if we tamper with a password? It doesn't let us go through. It's unauthorized. That would seem to, to tell us that everything's working as before. So hello, world. There we go. Now, let's create a new endpoint that will serve up the information, it'll serve up the authentication information about the currently authenticated user as JSON back to the client. But we don't want uh, you know, the client to be able to talk or to see other uh, people's information, right? We want to limit the access to other principal information uh, to just the uh, username implied by the authentication. So let's create an endpoint here that says git forward slash users forward slash username, right? And uh, here, again, we'll just create a new handler, like so. And we'll say that this handler is called username. And all we're going to do in this handler name, in this handler, is return the JSON information, right, for the, um, for the current principle. So the principle is a Java security principle, but that's not what we want. We know that behind the scenes, that principle is actually a authentication object. So let's uh, get rid of this, because we know that this isn't going to be 
the same type anymore, so we're going to say authentication.class.cast p, and then we know that the principal object is going to be a user details. That's the very same user details that we've just uh, persisted in our repository a few minutes ago. So we'll turn that into a user details. And there we are. There's our user details reference. We can dereference that to a details mono. And uh, maybe clean that up a little bit. There we go. So now we'll put that there, details mono, and we'll tell this the run the runtime that this is a user details object that should be treated as such. And um, let's just confirm that that works. Before we uh, dive into authorization, let's dive into let's just make sure that this is working as we expect. So uh, users are winch. There we are. There's our information. There's the same information for J Long. And what we want to do is we want to limit you know the authenticated user from accessing information that doesn't belong to that authenticated user. So we're going to do authorization in effect on that endpoint on that URL. So we do that here uh, in our security configuration. We go back to our security configuration here and we say uh, that for requests going to a certain path users forward slash username we want the following access decisions to apply, right? And uh, we have, we could, by the way, we could say that any request that comes in has to be authenticated. That's basically what we did before. We could say it has to have a certain authority or a certain role. But one of the new features uh, in Spring Security 5 is since it's based on uh, Java, Java 8 and, and Spring 5 is itself also based on Java 8, we can take advantage of lambdas. So there's this very convenient now uh, access callback here where we might have had to previously use a Spring expression language expression to do the sort of same dynamic uh, uh, control. We can now do that here just by providing a new reactive authorization uh, manager. So reactive authorization manager. <coughs> and um, this shouldn't be all that hard, right? We're going to say that we're going to, you know, we're going to check the incoming request, which has an authentication in it. This is already after the, the user has been authenticated. And we're going to, you know, figure out the name of the authenticated user and then see if it matches the URL against which we're making the request, right? So it's the uh, the context here uh, has the current username. So we're going to say mono dot map and auth auth dot dot get name equals context dot get variables dot get username, right? So that's a boolean, and we need to map that boolean into something called an authorization decision. So there's a constructor that just takes a boolean so we can just use a method reference like so, right? Okay, there's our, our uh, authorization check and of course this is a functional interface as well so we can replace that uh, accordingly and the code gets uh, very nice to read, right? Very clean, right? Very easy to follow what's happening and we get type safety here. It's not a spring expression language so that can be very very useful uh, if you're trying to figure out the, the chain of invocation. All right, so let's see if that works. Now, notice that we're doing this specific thing before we do the more broadly applicable thing down here, right? We're, we're saying, first check this very specific pattern, and then if it doesn't match anything in these, these paths that we specify, any, any number of paths or predicates that we specify, then use this one here and say that for any request into the service, uh, into the application, they, they should be authenticated, right? So let's see now if that works. Okay, so I'm authenticated right now. I'm going to authenticate as Arwinch, but I'm going to talk to uh, Jlong, right? And it says 403 forbidden. Now, what about Arwinch? There we are. So I've now accessed uh, the information specific to Arwinch. Uh, and of course, I've got my message endpoint as well. So there's hello Arwinch. So with that, we've looked at Spring Security 5. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. I've just touched on the integration for securing a basic web application using HTTP Basic, but of course you'll see a, a number of different uh, t protocols and technologies supported in Spring Security as usual. One of which, of course, is OAuth. So OAuth is a, uh, has been previously addressed and previously supported by uh, the Spring Cloud Security and Spring Security OAuth projects themselves. The Spring Security OAuth project is now being folded into Spring Security 5. So you'll see that out of the box, in supported and in interactive fashion in uh, Spring Security 5 itself. All right, with that, thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time.